Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Leistico of the Des Moines Register, Dargan Southard of the Des Moines Register here at MVP Arena, Dargan, uh, in Albany. Why are we doing this in Albany, by the way? The Hawkeyes good. defeat. Go ahead. <laughs> I, your we guess is as good as mine. No, We still don't know. Iowa beats Colorado 89-68, uh, uh, really uh, their best performance in the NCAA tournament by far. And I might even say their best performance of the postseason. Could that be a stretch? They played pretty well against Michigan, I guess. But uh, this was a domination of a really good team, a team that beat LSU by 14. Uh, and now the Hawkeyes face LSU two days from now uh, here in this arena on a, what's going to be an incredible stage Monday night on ESPN. Yeah, you know, Iowa shows up, and, and obviously they know, whether they admit it or not, that LSU had won before the Colorado game starts. And you could maybe see how that could potentially be a, a minor distraction or something like that. But, I mean, this team really put on a very business-like performance pretty much all the way through. And I think the biggest sign of that is, um, you know, obviously the scoring was very balanced and there was a lot of people who had good games. But there wasn't even really like – it just felt like very casual dominance. You know, that Iowa was just kind of getting whatever it wants. Caitlin Clark was – basically running a, a layup drill anytime she wanted to get into the rim. Um, and then you look up and it's a 15 point lead and the game's pretty much over at that point. So, um, you know, Iowa needed, not that anyone was really worried about the offense after Monday, but I do think that to kind of clear that off the recent history, have a performance that was way more indicative of the Iowa basketball uh, product we've seen so dominant of late. Um, and yeah, now uh, now we get to dive into Monday's fun, which uh, is going to be a mess, a great thing, an awful thing, all the adjectives you can think of. Uh, yeah, and again, this is going to be a great game on Monday. Why it had to happen in Albany, New York, I do not know. But uh, yeah, we're going to make it work and uh, should be a good one. So Colorado, this was Colorado's biggest loss of the season. Um, this was a good team. They're Last seven losses, all by single digits. Uh, they were in the conversation for a one seed, like I said. So um, it's not like you can expect this type of, type of domination. We saw this in the men's tournament. We've seen this in the women's tournament. Yesterday, um, three of the four underdogs either won outright. I think they – or one outright or Indiana, you know, gave South Carolina a battle. They were – it's not easy. And they, and they dominated – and I guess we got to start with Caitlin Clark, right? I mean, her game, we talked a little bit about one of the storylines coming in was like, you know, a little bit about her on-court demeanor. Again, manufactured by others, but she was calm and in control the whole game. I mean, there was a, other than a few, you know, discussions with the refs, uh, she was just cool, in control. Dominant nine for 10 from two point range. Dargan ends up with 29 points, 15 assists. I mean, the assists were that was one of her best passing games of her career, which is saying something. Also had six boards, but you know, Iowa has 20 assists uh, on the game. I can't believe they had 19 turnovers. I guess they did, but she only had two of them, and um, I thought was easily at her best so far in the tournament. Yeah, and you know, again, not that anybody was concerned by any means about anything, but I think Caitlin Clark would be the first to tell you that she kind of needed another resounding offensive performance to really kind of feel like everything was, was back where it needed to be. Um, and as you said, you know, the threes weren't really falling, but she was able to blow by any Colorado defender. They, they put on her um, looked like the South Carolina game at times with her just kind of casually driving to the hole wide open, laying it off the glass and in. Um, but, yeah, you know, definitely things seem to be turned down, toned down a little bit. Um, I don't know if something was said or if that was just kind of the way the game went, but it, there was definitely a noticeable lack of, I guess, the antics that so many people have become obsessed with on the court. So um, you, you really saw, I feel like, this team do what it needs to do at this stage. You know, it, it was – a game that Iowa was favored to win, you know, a, a decent margin, especially for a Sweet 16 game to be, you know, six, seven point favorite is is not always something you see. Um, and so, you know, now Iowa's back where it wants to be, back, you know, in the, in the spot that 
you know, even if it wasn't against LSU, it, it hoped to be back here playing for another chance to go to a final four. Um, and you know, everything that, that could be in play is, is going to happen. Um, and, and we'll see how Iowa handles it, but I, I, there's a lot of reason to feel confident that Iowa is going, you know, Iowa may lose on Monday, but it does. I, I do feel like there's a lot of confidence that the whole external element of the matchup is going to be able for Iowa to handle because, frankly, this is what they've been doing all year, blocking out distractions, whether it's Ice Cube's offer or, you know, this story or that story or this criticism or that criticism. I mean, Twitter has been a, a very eventful place for Iowa women's basketball chatter this year. And I think in hindsight, you know, it, it really is the perfect lead into this because, um, you know, it's going to there, there's going to be a lot of stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the game on the court and the, and the basketball matchups on the court that's going to be flying, you know, between now and, and 6 p.m. on Monday. But uh, I feel like I was in a good spot um, and should feel ready to go uh, for that one. Uh, let's uh, program record. By the way, 32nd win for the Hawkeyes. Pretty notable. <laughs> you know, uh, really didn't bring anyone new in and they got better record wise. And um, so, pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, only bit last Big Ten team standing. Um, lots of stuff, to, lots of storylines for this one. Let's talk about LSU at the end here, but let's talk about the supporting cast now. We talked about Caitlin. Uh, who jumped out to you the most? Uh, we can go through all the other four starters here. Um, I've got, I mean, you could talk, we could talk for five minutes about each one of them, but which one in particular you want to lead with Dargan? I'll start with, with Sid, you know, another, uh, great performance by her, somebody who's really not that anybody was worried that she wouldn't, but, um, when a starter goes down and you have to bring a pin piece off the bench, I mean, I don't think it, it could have, it could have gone any better. Um, the lift that Sydney Fulter has provided, um, in, in her, increased time. And, you know, she was one that was one of the few that even though Iowa had a lot of the same pieces back from last year's run, she was one of the few whose role was really different and had expanded um, going into, you know, compared to last year. And so for her to, you know, doesn't miss a shot from the only shot she missed from the field was a free throw. Um, she was six for six from the field, three or four from the line for 15 points. Um, you know, all the all the elements or all the adjectives that have been pegged with her, you know, re resilient, tough, um, all those things, you know, is showing up at the biggest and most crucial time of the year. Um, and so, you know, as much as as Monday didn't look like Iowa basketball, this was pretty much vintage Iowa basketball where, you know, even with Caitlin's dominance, you have production spread all throughout the lineup. Um, and, and that feels like the perfect boost. Uh, you know, as Iowa looks to keep rolling in this tournament. Yeah, Sid is a plus 32 on the plus minus. Uh, easily, that's easily the, t the best on the team. Caitlin was second with plus 22. Of course, of course it's plus 22, right? <laughs> she, uh, <laughs> the, the whole season just seems like it's just a line for Caitlin Clark. Anyway, I'll go with Gabby Marshall because this was something I talked about uh, before the game, during the game, and after the game, I talked with Kate Martin about this. Uh, I'll try to tweet this quote out, but like, whenever Gabby Marshall hits a three, Dargan, it solicits the loudest cheer in the building, more than Caitlin. Like Absolutely. when Gabby makes a three, it is like, you know, now we're rolling. And I talked to that. Mm -hmm. I talked to Kylie Fearbach about that yesterday. She's like, whenever we see Gabby hit that first one, it just gives us all confidence. And 42 seconds into the game, Dargan, she hits a three-pointer, and I was up 5-1. <laughs> Only time it trailed was one nothing after the first possession. 14 seconds it trailed. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and Gabby ends up with 14 points. She hits four or five from three-point range. Uh, obviously plays terrific defense, as always. And, uh, you know, thought she was – just just when you – we talked about this in the West Virginia game, too, I guess, Dargan. But when you see her play up close, you really appreciate – how good she is on both ends of the floor and how she just gives hundred percent effort. And I thought she was, she was outstanding. Um, I would say, I would say Sid two and, and Gabby three for me, as far as uh, performances for the Hawks tonight. Yeah. And you, you talk about the, the cheers for Gabby and that's something that, you know, was obviously very evident in Carver and is, has carried here. 
But, you know, I think that's significant because, you know, if there was one player this year that fans were kind of maybe running out of patience with at times, it was Gabby Marshall when she was struggling and not really bringing a whole lot to the table offensively. So for the Iowa fans to have that be the case early in the season, now we're in crunch time, you know, the the month that, that matters the most. Um, and they're there pouring on the support and Gabby Marshall's reciprocating it with, um, you know, some big shots and some big threes. I think that's kind of uh, a microcosm of how this team and the, the team and the fans are kind of woven together and intersect because, um, you know, I, I think we were, we were trying to break down the crowd percentage. Um, you know, it, it did seem like there was more Iowa fans here than any other team. I think that's certainly fair to say. Um, and they got probably the biggest cheers throughout the day, but, you know, it wasn't like black and gold everywhere or anything like that. So, um, you know, for all that to carry on to, you know, away from Carver and to still have that support and to have it be meaningful, I think is significant. And, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how all that comes together on Monday night, because, um, you know, I'd imagine Iowa and LSU fans are probably not each other's favorite people right now. So, um, Hopefully everybody can can stay under control, but uh, yeah, it was it was definitely it felt like the perfect appetizer leading into you know what everybody has been hoping for and and wanting since the bracket came out on Selection Sunday. And there were definitely some Colorado fans because they were right behind us, right behind where I'm sitting <laughs> there right was now. One girl were... who there was one girl who decided to screech and yell at the top oh, of her lungs every I... time Iowa took a free throw. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know why yeah, that they, was a, yeah. that was a move that had to be made, but it was. Yeah, uh, and obviously they were uh, not happy with the officiating. All no fans are ever happy with the officiating. I thought um, the officiating was fine, to be honest. Yeah, like, it, it was. didn't feel it, there wasn't any like glaring issues. There wasn't any glaring missed calls. I mean, for as much criticism as as women's basketball as officiating has gotten this year, uh, today seemed like a pretty decent yeah. effort. Yeah, Colorado shot more free throws. Iowa committed more fouls, just FYI. Colorado couldn't make a free throw. That was also part no. of the problem. Colorado couldn't make anything. <laughs> no, no. Colorado shoots 37.5% for the game, uh, including a scintillating 42.9% from the line. Um, other two sporting cast, uh, Kate Martin, that was kind of my, my off-the-bench click, pick-to-click, and really could have picked anybody today, um, or not off the bench, but other than Caitlin, click to Pick to click. 14 points, nine rebounds. She had a little foul trouble or probably would have had a double-double. She had a couple three-pointers. I thought both of them were huge. The one to start the third quarter, um, they got the Sid and one, and then the Kate three on a Caitlin assist. That gave Caitlin a double-double already. That put Iowa up 19, like a minute into the third quarter, and it was like, okay, we can start writing. And uh, we did. (laughs) And, And there was no drama after that. And and this then, is a very uh, reporter-friendly game. Yeah, very much so. Uh, we made deadline for for Prince, so that's good. Uh, Hannah Stolke also uh, with a double-double, 11 points, 10 rebounds. She was going against, uh, you know, Aronette Vonley and uh, Coy Miller and, you know, two girls that are six foot three, and they were uh, very happy that Hannah did not give up a single offensive rebound to either when she was in the game which is pretty impressive, really, because uh, Colorado mm-hmm. had 21 offensive rebounds against the Hawkeyes last year uh, when Sonata was the five. So uh, a really nice game from Hannah. She didn't score after halftime, but they didn't need her to. She uh, she did a really good job. You know, it was a solid five for seven from the line, too. She's really, you know, she's not been a total liability at the line this year uh, in the postseason. And uh, I just thought, I mean, obviously the starting five played great. Um, so Stolke and Martin. Yeah, and I feel like with with Stolke's free throw shooting, obviously it's been a hot topic for the whole year. But you know these aren't you can't simulate the free throws here. And and while you know you can shoot as many as you want in an open practice gym and all that, when the spotlight's on and March is here and you need to make clutch free throws, um, it, it's a different pressure regardless of how much you've practiced it. And so for her to, you know, every time she gets the ball and gets fouled, it's no longer you, f- you no longer feel like you missed a shot there because, you know, she's – even if she gets one at the line, that's, that's you know, a win a lot of the time. And so, um, you know, she's – you can see her confidence kind of, you know, hit and miss a little bit, but 
it seems like that, you know, a lot of everything that she's worked on this year seems to be coming to fruition now. Um, and, and she's, she, I feel like she has the one, the, the, the in, most interesting matchup uh, Monday night, largely uh, going with Angel Reese there. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that matchup now. Uh, by the way, as you were talking, I don't, we'll have to look this up. Caitlin Clark did not shoot a free throw today. I wonder when the last time wow. that happened. Um, you know, she shot, what, 12 in the <laughs> West Virginia game? Was, like, the only thing that kept her afloat in that game, really. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to score 29 without a free throw, not bad. Very efficient. Um, let's talk about LSU. Uh, we saw them play UCLA right in front of us here. And, uh, we both kind of t- were talking to each other during the game, Dargan, and maybe I will regret saying this, but I feel like Iowa matches up better with LSU than it would have with UCLA. The Hawkeyes are early one-and-a-half-point favorites, which is exactly the line you predicted, so you are uh, get a lot of credit for that. Nice going there. Uh, I like the matchups. I mean, I, I don't think – I'm not saying Iowa's going to win, but I feel like – just seeing them up close, I don't feel like I was going to be overwhelmed with some size disadvantage, and I feel like Clark can match Van Lith easily. I mean, Van Lith, you know, doesn't have great explosion, and I feel like you know a key matchup also is going to be Gabby Marshall on Flau J Johnson, who was tremendous against UCLA today. Was the best player on LSU uh, this afternoon. Yeah, and that was a game that it was kind of interesting because. Um, you know, when Iowa played in the final four, they were the second game and LSU was the first game and they kind of had a a game that was a little bit similar, maybe not so much stat wise, but just flow wise where, you know, it was, you know, they had some moments up, then the, the opponent came back, UCLA came back, made it a game. And then it was kind of a, you know, one that they had to deliver in winning time down the stretch. So, um, you know, I don't think it's a situation where, you know, I was had the the final score of the championship game as the background on everybody's phone. And, you know, they, they were doing, you know, a little dance when LSU got in their bracket, but I think now that it's here and it's actually happening, I think inevitably, um, you know, the motivation from, from dropping last year and having a chance to, you know, you know, it'd be one thing if Iowa was playing LSU like in December or something like that. And it was just kind of clear that that was not anywhere close to the title games magnitude. And it was more manufactured, but for them to meet not only in the NCAA tournament, but deep in the NCAA tournament, both going for another final four shot. I feel like that, that is kind of the perfect uh, vibe and the perfect energy to be surrounding this game, because um, it's really going to be a battle of who can manage or who can keep what's on the court front and center because, um, you know, again, no one needs to recap what, what these two teams have been paired with all off season and stuff like that. Um, you know, it, tomorrow's media session is going to be obviously, you know, every topic regarding these two is probably going to come up. Um, and so it's, it's on Iowa to kind of lock in, um, you know, block a lot of that out and see uh, and see just basketball wise, uh, what they can do because um, you know you look at you look at at how both these teams got here. You know LSU had a little bit of, of issues too before this round um, and looked you know more like themselves beyond that. So um, yeah, it's exciting. You know I I was kind of manifesting it maybe to not happen because of all the toxic nature of the of the discussion regarding those two. But now that it's here and now that it's going to happen, um, I think it's going to be very intriguing on the court and uh, should be in for a good one Monday night. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, LSU assembled what everyone said was a super team before the season. They were the clear number one in the preseason. Uh, they've had a really strong season, a couple slip-ups here and there, but South Carolina has been better than them so far this year. So uh, they come into the tournament as a three seed and – they are, you know, they're beatable. They're beatable, and Iowa, I think, comes in with a tremendous amount of confidence. I think they come in not really feeling the pressure. I asked Kate Martin about that, too, and she was just like, no, nah, we don't – I mean, we really don't feel pressure. We, we're not getting nervous. We're used to this, and of course they're used to this. They've been used to this all year long, and uh, I feel like 
I know people were scared of maybe some people were kind of like not happy that LSU was in Iowa's bracket, but I think I was ready. I think I was ready for them. I'm not saying they're going to beat them, but I think they're ready for LSU. They can beat LSU. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a great coach and a really uh, great, you know, collection of players over there, but it's Iowa is too, <laughs> you know, Iowa's got a good team too, a really good team and uh, led by the best player in the country. I, uh, there was a Breaking Bad uh, clip that was circulating on Twitter after the bracket came out. And I thought it was a perfect summation of that perception of things. Um, it's when Walter is talking to Skyler and he says, I'm not in danger. I am the danger. And so, you know, was it, was it totally, you know, did, did the three and the one totally line up between LSU and Iowa? Probably not, but you know, is this LSU's bracket or is this Iowa's bracket? Because, um, you know, I think both feel like that they should be in the spot that they're in and win Monday night. Um, so I don't know. I, th- I think it's, I, you know, as much as, as it probably is by the time it tips Monday night, I'm going to be ready to be done talking about it. But now that it's, that's what's next, you know, I feel like it, it's, it's in a good spot for Iowa because, um, you know, they should feel confident and they should feel like on this stage, you know, uh, a different result can happen than obviously what went down last year. Well, Dargan and I have to be back here early for media tomorrow. So we will have more coverage at hawkcentral.com. I've still got to finish writing my, you know, improved column for the website. Uh, we want to get you this podcast quickly here uh, from MVP Arena. So uh, stay tuned for our better stories in the next hour or two. And uh, there's a bunch of videos up as well. Tyler's even writing a story back home. So thanks, Tyler Tashman, writing a story on Sid of Folter. Uh, maybe it's up already. So uh, what, what we're saying is we're going to leave you for now, but stay tuned for more tomorrow. And obviously, we will be here Monday night. And uh, for however long this thing lasts for the Iowa Hawkeyes, who head to the Elite Eight for the third time in the last five tournaments, also a pretty impressive accomplishment. For Dargan Southern, Chad Leistico saying so long, and we will talk to you soon.